there are said to be three kinds of dukkha. There's dukkha dukkata, dukkha viparinama, and dukkha sankata. Dukkha dukkata, we could say, is like dukkha as dukkha, or dukkha per se. This is the kind that is adequately translated as suffering. Any experience of body or mind that is felt as painful. Uh, so stepping on a sharp stone, cutting your foot, is clearly dukkha, dukkha dukkata. This is a, a moment of of suffering per se. And it's also mental suffering, grief, sense of loss, sense of uh, anguish. These are dukkha dukkata. So this is dukkha associated with unpleasant feeling. Dukkha viparinama is the dukkha of changeableness. And that's the kind of dukkha that's associated with pleasant feeling. So even the most enjoyable experiences, the most pleasant objects that we encounter are dukkha. But they're dukkha in this sense uh, of viparinama, which points out the aspect that they're not lasting. They fall away. But I think it's also important here is the aspect that any phenomena in the conditioned world, no matter how enjoyable or blissful it might be, is imperfect and ultimately unsatisfying that the mind cannot be satisfied by any fully by any conditioned object uh, this is the dukkha that's associated with pleasant feeling that there's an aspect of dukkha in the imperfection in the incompleteness of pleasant moments Dukkha Sankata is Dukkha as an inherent phenomenon. So this is the type of Dukkha associated primarily with neutral feeling. That there's inherently a imperfection, a provisional nature associated with each moment. One of the things that's important to understand in thinking about this is that dukkha is inherent in the objects. It's not something that we impose on reality with our mind. You know, this is one of the this is one of the ways I think in which it has been misunderstood. Some people have presented Buddhist teachings in a way that implies that the problem is entirely subjective, that uh, the world is perfect as it is, we're just seeing it wrongly somehow. This is not the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha taught that the conditioned realm is inherently imperfect, uh, impermanent, is, is breaking up, unsatisfying. Uh, these are inherent fundamentally to the object. Uh, it's not something that we impose on reality with our, our perception. In fact, not seeing this, not seeing the inherent imperfection of things is classed as a uh, hallucination, a vipalasa, or meaning a perversion of view. We're seeing things wrongly if we don't see them in, in this way, as flawed. Yeah. Now, this is part of the very fabric of reality. And it's not a value judgment. It's not, um, it's not a moral judgment. It's just a statement of the way things are. The very fact of objects, whether um, external or internal, whether 
sentient objects or insentient objects, the very fact that they exist, that they're manifest, that they're functional in the universe is an inherent flaw. It's the only way they can manifest is through partiality. It's part of the fact of being in existence. You know, the fact of motion, of change, of of life, of existence, of reality is this uh, constant rubbing. You know? This is what uh, Tanisaro means when he translates dukkha as stress. It's actually quite a good uh, suggestion, but it's misunderstood by people. I think it's unfortunate because when you hear it, you think psychological stress. And he's quite clear in his explanation in um, why he chose stress. It's not, he says it's not in the psychological sense, but in the engineering sense. Stress, like the stress in two members of a suspension bridge that are in stress. You know, you balance the stress that holds the thing up. That um, that mechanical parts in a in a machine are under stress, and they have to be engineered to be strong enough to take the stress because they're rubbing, wearing, pulling, pushing. And this is what's meant by uh, his use of the word stress to translate dukkha. Because the elements of reality are constantly rubbing, stressing, pushing, pulling against each other. And it's this activity that constitutes uh, reality as we know it. Things would not be able to be in existence unless they were, in some sense, imperfect, uh, partial, incomplete. And, um, the expression of phenomena in manifestation is itself uh, a kind of a incompleteness, is a kind of a brokenness of, of the totality. So this is very fundamental to the very fabric of reality as we experience it. And this is, uh, this is a dukkha. That's why we use the term conditioned reality. Perhaps the fundamental distinction is between conditioned reality and the unconditioned. The unconditioned is Nibbana. Uh, there is no Dukkha. It's transcended this reality. So it's transcended the dualities of existence and non-existence is transcended manifestation. It doesn't uh, experience this incompleteness, this suffering, this imperfection. And contrasted to that is the ordinary experience of the conditioned realm, conditioned reality, meaning that things are subject to cause and effect, that things are inherently imperfect, partial. Things are inherently incomplete. Nothing exists in isolation. No phenomena, no um, mind moment, no being, uh, no object. Nothing can exist entirely as a uh, as an isolated unit. The idea of a discrete object is just a mental abstraction that we can use to make sense of the universe. Everything only exists as reflections and results and causes. This is the web of interdependence. The dependent origination extended to infinity, you know, that all objects are 
inherently dependent on other objects and the web is very complex and is actually incomprehensible in all its refinement. But it means that any particular thing that we define as a discrete object is simply a, a, a transient node in this shifting web of reality. Nothing exists from its own side. Nothing is inherently real on its own, discreetly.